you can get involved with the community and with the projects that are out there. Okay, sound good? Anyone want to go straight to the quantum computing? No. <laughs> you got Okay, so um, I guess I'm going to start with this very important message that um, in this day and age, uh, science seems to be discounted when it comes to things like, you know, believing in climate change and fake news. So I have a message to start with that is science is real. <laughs> I think we've got the right audience here. So science is real. And science at Eclipse is really, really cool. And I hope you'll agree with me by the end of this presentation. So the remit of the group is to come together to work on these reusable open source software tools and services. So that's our mission, just anything in the scientific domain, it doesn't matter where it gets used, but just that can we collaborate and perhaps innovate in this domain. So some of the problems um, that we're facing in the scientific domain, um, one of them is to do with data. So Diamond Light Source, who are one of our members, they have the scientists who talk about, uh, back in 2005, one of the scientists said, I have all the data I have ever collected on a floppy disk and process it by hand. And then that same scientist in 2014, he in just two months had collected one terabyte of data. So the amount of data that we're dealing with, um, not just in scientific domain, but in any domain is just growing exponentially. So big data is definitely one of the challenges that falls under the remit of the group. Other things we're looking at is generally scaling tools, reproducibility, how can we conduct an experiment and have the same tools and the same data and give it to someone else and have them come up with the same results and the same conclusion. And that ties in with integration. We've got so many different tools, so much fragmentation, we need to solve that. Yet we have limited resources, and yet sometimes scientific publications don't even recognize um, software as part of the key to doing, to doing science. So one of the interesting things I find um, is, well, these problems aren't necessarily specific to the scientific domain, um, which is one of the great things about being part of the wider Eclipse community, that um, some of the solutions we come up with will apply much more broadly. Okay, so um, at a glance at who's involved with the group, um, we've got our steering committee members and our participating members. And one of the things um, I'm particularly really proud of is that uh, we have quite a good mix. So we've got scientific institutions like um, Oak Ridge National Labs and Diamond Light Source. Then we've got big enterprise companies, people like IBM and Airbus, and they're working side by side uh, with small, small companies like my company, Kitra Coders. We've got Itema as well. Plus we've got universities in there. So it's a really good mix of um, different types um, that come from different positions and add a lot to the equation. But what that doesn't reflect, and actually are probably the most important, are all the individuals who make up the group. So we pride ourselves on just being a fun group of unique individuals. We like getting together, different events. That's our unofficial motto from from the movie The Martian, if anyone's seen that. But uh, yeah, I think it pretty much applies to, to all our projects. So it's a really good group, um, and we like to kind of work together, but we like to have fun while we're doing it as well. Okay, let's talk about our projects. And this is our lovely rendering by Torquild of our, the treasures of the science working group, as we refer to them. Okay, so in the beginning, um, when the group started off, it was companies and institutions working on scientific workbenches, so, so big monolithic applications that uh, I think almost all of them were based on Eclipse RCP. 
So we had things like um, ChemClips, we had the integrated computing environment. So these are all kind of the starter projects that, that we got started with. And the data analysis workbench from Diamond Light Source. But one of the things we started noticing is that a lot of them were doing the same functionality. And in this trend of um, splitting up monoliths to microservices, uh, we started to identify areas which had a lot in common and say, well, can we split these into blocks of components we can reuse? So when we analyzed it further, we saw that there were some fundamental building blocks, so things like visualizations, 2D and 3D, workflows, common data structures, and scripting, which was almost always Python. So then we started looking at how we could build up projects around each of these areas. So we now have um, a project in, in each of these areas which can be reused and which we're working towards making completely interoperable with each other. And the great news is that just this month, we celebrated our second simultaneous release. So four of those projects, plus the domain-specific Eclipse TechLips, all released in October. Um, and this is a really good thing, because in Eclipse, we're known for the simultaneous release. And um, to take that ability and move it to another working group and have us kind of recreate that for ourselves, that, that, was, that was really big. So, so if you want to go ahead and clap, I'm not going to stop you. <laughs> No, so well done to everybody who was involved, and it was a lot of work. Um, I'll give you a quick run through of the projects, and if the leads are in the room, I'm going to point them out so you know who to go talk to. So first of all, we've got TechLips. This is um, a mature ex project that um, existed outside the Eclipse ecosystem, but we brought it in, and it's all about um, rendering LaTeX and being able to use LaTeX. Um, so I'm not sure you can see that, or maybe you can, but. Um, you have the editor where you can edit LaTeX and then you can generate it in your scientific publication. And Tokild up here in front is project lead. So do come see him if um, you're interested in getting involved with that or using it. Second project is the Eclipse Advanced Visualization Project. So that takes advantage of um, connecting up to different uh, visualization frameworks. And I know Philip Wenig, at don't know if he's here, but he's done some work connecting up um, with the, some of the charting displays you see here. So Philip's around at the conference as well. Um, talk to him about visualizations. Uh, Triquetrum is our project that deals with workflows. And I don't think we have members here today, but come ask me if you're interested um, in just basic workflows and it builds on technologies like GEF and modeling underneath. And then we've got the advanced scripting environment. And this gives us a Python scripting, so lot, we can integrate that into workbenches and use Python to not only run scripts um, and calling things like NumPy and SciPy, but also integrate those to be able to run actions in the Eclipse workbench, like plotting, so you could use a Python script to set up your entire workbench and put out a plot with um, some of the visualization stuff. So it's a pretty cool project. Uh, Christian Pontesega is the project lead for that, and he's around, so do go see him. Ask him about the Jupyter integration we have with that and how you can use yeah, just Python scripting to, to run your workbench. And finally, we've got the Eclipse January project. So we call this um, a NumPy for Java. So it's a way to express uh, and manage your multidimensional arrays in Java. And it's one of those projects which we, we've seen some success. It's gone out to, the, to an, an IoT use case. Um, so that's been pretty exciting to have it used for edge processing just because it is common data structures I'm going to give you a quick demo so you get a bit of an idea of how you can use them and um, just try them out for yourself. Oh, and I'll mention that Jonah Graham sitting here in the front is the project lead for that. So um, talk to Jonah if you have any questions. 
some of the new features in the new release for January were the support for units of measurement. So you could have a way of putting some measurements on there. January jars are available on Maven Central, so you can now pull those in. You don't have to rely on Eclipse to use it. And the best bit, you can get started easily without having to download it. So I'm going to give you a quick demo of that. So if you go to the January website, which is eclipse.org slash January, and skip to the try it out bit, this, this does rely on Wi-Fi, so we'll give it a go. Um, under the Getting Started Guide, you've got this Quick Start Interactive Lab. So give that a click, and it goes into this framework. If you're coming in for the first time, you will have to log in. Um, but I'm just logged in here with my GitHub account. Um, so it's a platform called Catacoda, which is great for interactive tutorial. And what we're going to do is we run it here using Java 9's JShell, so we can do it interactively. So I'll just go ahead and click Start on the Scenario. It gives me a shell. It's going to pull in the January jars and all the dependencies and give me sort of a playground where I can run Java 9 and, and try things out. So you go ahead and type what it suggests for you there, but you can also just be lazy like I'm going to do and click on it. So first of all, we import the January data sets. Then to create a data set, um, we'll use the data set factory, create from object method. So in this case, we want to create a two-dimensional array um, with, with these numbers in it. And you'll see when we do it, a, the two-string, what we've got is a one-dimensional array with those nine elements. So the tutorial walks you through how you can reshape that to a two-dimensional shape. So we'll say, let's reshape to three by three, and then we print that out. And that's given us our, our three by three make um, multi-dimensional array. Or you can just do that all in one step, which is quite nice. So this will kind of walk you through kind of the key API and really give you an idea of um, what kind of things you can do with it. So you, once you have your data set, you can get the shape. And those of you who have used NumPy will find that there's a lot of symmetry with the API with that of NumPy. So data set get shape gives us three by three. And get rank. Rank is the dimensions of the array. So in this case, it's a 2D array. So we expect to get rank to return two, which it does. Um, we can initialize data sets with ranges. So in this case, we've done 0 to 14. Or we can use random numbers. We can initialize with random numbers. So in this case, I've got a 3 by 5 initialized with random numbers. And JShell is quite fun because for the first time we've got this nice interactive environment um, in Java, which you can just play around with in the same way you might with Python. So we can also do in-place addition. So I'm going to take this array. It's just catching up. And then I'm going to add um, 100 to, to each one. Oops. Sorry. Sorry, the add was back there. I've, I've lost step with myself. But you can do an in-place add with just the I add command. And in that case, it will take our array from earlier here. And no, sorry, it takes a new one and it adds 100 to each one. OK, and then the last bit shows you how you can go about slicing data sets so this is where you start to see the, the real benefit of using um, January over things like um, double arrays. So if we had this data set here, and we just wanted, say, 2, 3, 5, and 6 as, as a slice, um, you could go ahead and use the index positions and say, from that data set, get me the slice, providing the index is in the right place. And then you'll be able to extract that specific bit of data. Um, so yes, yeah, so you can go ahead just from the website and give that a go and, and try that out before you even have to get into an IDE. So that's, that's really cool. Okay. Let's 
we have it doing? So all the solutions we have, although we use them in science, they have applicability to other areas, to IoT and location tech. They probably apply to your domain as well. So have a look and uh, see what, what's there. OK, so now we're going to do switch track completely to talk about one of our newest projects, which is quantum computing and a project we call Eclipse XACC which stands for Extreme Scale Accelerated Programming the Framework. Um, so this framework is developed by the folks at ORNL and Alex McCaskey, he's the project lead. So he gave me the quick primer into what it is so I could come and share that with you. And so is, is anyone here studying or working in quantum computing? Okay, I'm going to talk to you later. <laughs> Anyone else who's read about it or interested in it in general? Yeah. Okay, so um, I think in, in the talks we've been having and all, all the readings I've been doing, one of the things that keeps coming back is this lovely quote from Richard Feynman who says, I think I can safely say that nobody understands quantum mechanics. And what I'm going to say is Richard Feynman has never heard me explain it. So <laughs> um, I think I'm going to give you an explanation that would have him applauding and have him turning in his grave at the same time. Because that is basically the fundamentals of um, quantum theory is all about qubits which can be in a zero one state simultaneously. So traditional um, programming, you have a bit, it's a zero or one, but in quantum computing, you have a qubit, um, which is a superposition of both states at the same time. And so it can be a zero, it's a zero and a one with a probability. And we don't know what that state is until we measure it. So that's why we talk about, um, if you've heard of Schrodinger's cat, and you, you've, you've got a cat in a box, and you don't know whether it's dead or alive and you while well, it's in the box. But the minute you open the box, then you'll know for sure. So that's the same idea of, of these qubits. And, and that's as far as I'm going to go, because um, we're going to focus on the, the computing side of it now. How am I doing you up there? Does that sound good? <laughs> He's going like that. So he'll be answering the questions at the end. So. <laughs> OK, so um, when it comes to heterogeneous uh, computing, in the past we've, we've used GPUs. And you, it's not exactly straightforward. So we've had to have new programming models to do this. And it's frameworks like CUDA and OpenCL. And so what we want to get to um, with today's quantum architectures is can we use them in that same way as accelerators? So today's quantum architectures fall in two camps. So you've got um, gate models, which is things like IBM's. Um, IBM has lots of architectures around the gate models. And then there's the quantum annealing side, which is things like D-Wave. So for the rest of the talk, I'm not even going to go near the quantum annealing stuff. Uh, if you want to know more, ask, ask, ask our friend at the back. <laughs> right? Is that OK? <laughs> So all I'll say is the, the annealing stuff is like the analog quantum computers, really, really complex. But when we talk about the gate model, um, you can start mapping some of the same concepts we have today. But the whole idea is that either of these architectures, you could take those and you could use them as an accelerator. So you could have so classical computing. And for certain types of algorithms, um, quantum accelerators can give you sort of much better performances. It's, it's not an improvement across the board, um, but in certain cases, um, the, they can, you know, the, the promise of what they can do is, is pretty amazing. Um, and one of the things that uh, was really, like so I talked to Alex and he was like, well, what, what do these machines look like? So it's like, yeah, it's pretty much um, at Oak Ridge, they've got these, it's 10 meters by 10 meter massive framework and, um, all of it is about kind of getting the chip inside it to the right temperature. So they can only work, you can only take advantage of that at these really, really cold temperature. 
which is anyone want to guess it's in kelvin how how cold can they yeah uh, so it's about 15 15 micro kelvin which is basically colder than interstellar space so when we start getting to kind of the quantum architectures that can operate at you know higher temperatures then I think things will get really exciting. We can imagine we could just put it on a server rack. Um, so it's pretty exciting. It's a space that's moving very, very, very quickly. What does it look like to program one of these things? Um, and the answer is when you're talking about gate models, uh, you can just do qubit operations. So you can operate on the qubits. Uh, you can do things like rotations, entangling. And then when you want to get the results, that's when you do your measure then the measure is like opening your box to see, you know, what is the state. Um, so the landscape as it stands is you've got all these different companies working on it and they're each coming out with their own programming language. You've got the gate model stuff on that side. You've got the um, annealing stuff on this side. And for each, you know, for each language, you have to port it to each architecture. And you can see there's, there's massive fragmentation um, already starting to, to build up. Um, so that's where XACC comes in. Why can't we have a common interface, a common layer that you can run on any hardware? So it's completely hardware agnostic, and you can kind of switch in and switch out to a simulator. You could switch to some hardware and just using XACC um, as your programming level. And it's also targeting um, HPC environments, which some of the existing languages don't do. Okay, so at a glance, uh, it's developed by um, Oak Ridge National Labs. It's part of the Eclipse Foundation, so it's completely open source. So it's um, C++. So, you know, Eclipse is much more than um, just Java and Java frameworks. Um, but it's got some Python um, a wrapper, so you can also run it using its Python interface. And sorry, I'll show you this first. So, and then there's a number of plugins. So you've got plugins for a lot of the common um, architectures that are out there, things like D-Wave and Rigetti. And Oak Ridge have their own simulator, which is this TQV, TQNVM. So just so you know, IBM announced a simulator very recently, which was like, oh, some things we thought were previously impossible, we've now done um, with the simulator. So I talked to Alex about the Oak Ridge simulator, and I was like, oh, how many qubits can you simulate with that? And he, was, he basically said, look, I don't want to tell you till the paper comes out, but it's going to be good. And I think he was alluding to, to things like you know, simulating three-digit qubits, which you can only really do by um, using a tensor network, because then you're, not, um, you're making some optimizations, so you can actually do much larger simulations with your available memory and power. So I'll show you that in a bit. Um, I'm not going to go into this too much, but some of the programming concepts mirror those that we have today. So you've got a compiler, which compiles to intermediate representation, which runs on the accelerator. So I'll show you um, how you could try it out today. So what's available is for this simulator, the TQVM, um, there's a project set up in a IPython notebook, which you can run from a Docker container. So I've got that set up here. Uh, just going to check it's still running. Yep. So I've got Docker downloaded um, Alex's uh, container, and I'll, I'll give you the links to that, but you do a Docker pull and then you just run it. Then I've connected to the notebook here. And just to go back to the slides. Okay, I have no idea what this does. I'll give you the high level. Um, it gives you the energy. It works out the energy of like hydrogen and my understanding is we can do this for certain molecules today, but others are just so complex and intractable that we need kind of quantum computers to figure it out. 
And once we can do that, then all of a sudden we're understanding how things really work at a molecular level. It has implications, let's say, in agriculture. It has implications for, you know, um, just understanding the world, which can affect everything from climate change to like massive, massive problems. So this is all good stuff. So in this notebook, you can just run through the example. So I'll do that now. Um, As you can see, it's using um, XACC Python bindings, and it's going to just plot out the results to matplotlib. The main thing I want to illustrate is that for those of you who might be more interested and do know what is going on, is that you can just try it out for yourself today. So this is the kernel bit of it. Um, this is the specific kind of algorithm as you... Um, so we're just going to step through that. I'm not going to say much more than that. Um, but this is where the interesting bit of XACC comes in. You get your accelerator, you allocate some qubits, and then you build it, and then at the end you get your result. And then you're going to execute the kernels over a range of parameters to work out your energy for, for that mod, I think it's hydrogen in this case. And then finally, um, you're going to plot it. So take your time, um, have a look at that, and you, you kind of get the plot out at the end, and you close out the framework. So the main thing I'm just going to emphasize is that this is running on the simulator, and if you just change that to IBM, and then you write nicely to IBM and say, please, can I use your quantum architecture, which I tried to sign up for, but I have not got access yet. Um, but all you do is change that, and then you should be able to run this same example on the IBM architecture. So that, um, if there's nothing else you take away from this is, one, you can go out and try this yourself today, and two, it really is about um, open source and hardware agnostic um, compute, uh, using quantum accelerators. So just to finish, a uh, big thanks to Alex for kind of providing the slides and the example. And we might get him to do a webinar as well for people who want to go more into depth or learn, sort of keep up with what's going on. But the basic idea is you program your quantum code once in your language, and XACC handles the rest. So if you remember, um, it's just like when we talk about Java, write once, run everywhere. So XACC is write once, run everywhere for quantum computing. So I think that's pretty, pretty damn cool. OK, so just to wrap up, um, come get involved. There's multiple ways um, we encourage people to engage with the Science Working Group. So you can just be a lurker, sign up to our mailing list, see what we're talking about, or sign up to specific project mailing lists like XACC. Um, if you want to be a fan, you know, follow us on Twitter, do retweets and likes, or join in at the events. We're having a science boff this evening at 6.30, so you feel free to come along to that and see, meet some of the community. Um, you can contribute with code or reporting bugs. You can become a committer on projects or evangelize for the group. And then at the strategic level, um, if you're a member or your company's a member of Eclipse Foundation, you can get involved leading projects, being part of the steering committee, and uh, just kind of pushing things forward in that way. It's never been easier to start a new science project. We have our own top level. Um, IP checks are done much, much quicker these days. And we have the new version of uh, the license, EPL v2, which has some provision for GPL compatibility. Um, so for certain projects, that means we can now, uh, it now allows for a lot more than we could um, with EPL v1. And again, I'm going to emphasize, you know, it's not about just Eclipse IDE. It's not about just Java. We're talking about any language or any framework that solves a problem in, in a scientific domain that um, we think others could benefit from and we want to work together. So yeah, science is real. Science is fun. And science is everywhere. Yeah, do come join us. Thank you. Right, I'm not going to take your questions, if anyone's got any. Anyone? 
Okay, great. Thank you very much. Oh, wait. <laughs> yes. No, so it is specifically on the the data structures, like how you represent uh, multi-dimensional arrays and what operations you can perform on them. So there's nothing to do with with plotting. Uh, MATLAB is a whole tool. We're just January is just a library. Are you familiar with NumPy from Python? So it's completely the Java equivalent of NumPy, and uh, do you want to add anything to that, Jonah? That's MATLAB-like. Okay. Any other questions? Um, yeah, you can come catch us at the Science Boffo anytime today. Thank you very much. Yes.